Well, good afternoon and um, thank you all for coming to this presentation. Compared to what I've been listening in the last few weeks, I pretty much come from a very ancient age because I've been here for 22 years, joined in 1997. Over that time, um, I have done lot, quite a few different stuff in the process, graduated 26 uh, PhD students, most of them, I think 15 of them are in OEMs like Siemens, Mitsubishi, GE, Tartan Whitney, uh, Northrop Grumman, um, Honeywell, and things like that. Uh, five have gone to become university professors, and then others as university researchers, small companies want to NASA. And this group and the research has been supported by number of sponsors, including um, uh, uh, NASA and Siemens. In the early days, I used to be working on miniature engineering systems initiative started by Dr. Chow. That was probably for about five years or so, and you see a debris active iron etched centrifugal compressor. But from about mid 2000s, I moved over to turbo machineries, whether it is for power generation, aviation, or space, uh, doesn't matter for wherever turbo machine can be useful. We informally started Cater or Center for Advanced Turbo Machine and Energy Research in 2007, official start in 2012, and with a bunch of different applications in mind. A uh, few years ago, for example, we reached the peak point of almost 600K per faculty per, per year in that specific year. And this is kind of has been successful because of Cater's focus on systems which also, by the way, directly helps the students in their employment and career. With that in mind, let me mention to you what is the motivation for doing this. Well, if I look at all the different turbo machineries that Cater have been involved with, I see from um, power generations to aviations, even space syst uh, propulsion systems. The one on the lower left that you cannot see is actually a F-15 engine core um, for an engine test. Uh, bed. And if I ask myself where all these turbo machines could be used in Florida, who can hire our students, I see a very large um, group of companies starting from GE with their uh, national plant in Pensacola to Siemens and Mitsubishi in Orlando area to Pratt & Whitney in the Palm Beach area. And so that is why we started or decided to start um, the center for Ket called Cater. And if I just focus more exactly on the turbo missionary companies, then I see that pretty much all the, most of the arrows point to Florida. And as trusty walls helped me to write this article, um, we are the tar on the turbine turnpike. Now, one thing I like to point out that these power generations or aviations or space where there are lots of these companies in Florida, they all share the same set of fundamental sciences. We are going to the details of those, those fundamental sciences, bridge across mechanical arrow, computer science stat, statistics, modeling simulations and training from multiple colleges. And that is what one of the big strength of Cater or what we do. Now, one last thing I like to point out in this slide is that this is kind of a amazing changes that have been happening in the energy area. This is the slide or pie chart from 2019 uh, annual energy outlook, and it has been fascinating to see how the pies are changing over the last 10 years. And coal is shrinking, natural gas has gone up actually, nuclear is shrinking, but this specific uh, slice, which is for solar, is supposed to be becoming about four times or five times larger over the next 30 years. That would be affecting others. But one key thing to point out is this, this last block over here. As Europe and US, are reducing their coal usage, which is the bottom two uh, blocks there. The Asia Pacific area is actually, the coal usage has gone up. So even if we become totally zero, we have to figure out how to um, address that issue. And hence we have to make sure that we build engines that cover all these different applications. Now going for what we should be looking for for the future. Well, this has been a slide that I've been sharing with my colleagues. Um, over the last few years. Uh, so from CNC to additive manufacturing to different new cycles, alternative fuel storage, digital twin, 
they all kind of address these hot issues that are in the in the in the being funded and and we have been kind of look at those first and try to figure out what are the fundamental sciences necessary to address them for example in 2011 we got a additively manufactured leading edge for a turbine blade done at Aachen um, and then um, we um, in 2012 we started doing supercritical CO2 again in 2012 we started doing digital twin and all of those have been giving uh, bearing fruits in what we do one last thing in this topic is that world's very first CO2 cycle power plant has come up in uh, near Houston and then the second one would, is being worked on by Siemens in, in Canada. And similarly, the very first largest uh, renewable storage facility is coming up below the desert of Utah, where even in one cave, the entire Empire State Building can fit in. But they all give newer challenges and that is what we need to be prepared for. So I will kind of go slowly over this um, um, set of slides. So let us say this is a power plant, something that can produce one gigawatt, one million houses it can provide. And this is a commercial airplane. And I'm only fo focusing on the engine, but not just the entire engine, but the portion of the engine that sees the highest temperature and that requires special technologies. And that is how those airfoils would look like. Some of the larger ones, which are on the other side, may actually pull with 400 tons centrifugal force each, rotating at 3,000 or 3,600 RPM. So there is tremendous amount of techn technological difficulties there. But then if we kind of look for lower ticket price or lower electricity, we all like to have higher efficiency and that calls for higher maximum higher temperature, but we are already above the material limit. So now if I look at the material limit, what does it entails or not or gives us, even near 50 degree Fahrenheit change in temperature at this very critical area can change the light by 2.8 times. And that is obviously something to be very much concerned about. So we come up with very different technologies to address them. Cooling, that is what I do, or thermal barrier coating, that is my uh, colleague at Keta, Dr. Raghavan Siras, and then uh, ceramic matrix composites and things like that. So, but then there the problem starts. For example, here I'm showing a Rolls-Royce uh, blade with a lot of newer features where we are basically in, impinging the coolant jets on a hot surface. And as the coolant jet is hitting these walls, they are rolling up because of viscosity and creating vortices. And those are unstable vortices. They break down into smaller ones, smaller ones break down even smaller ones and creating a whole cascade of eddies covering a very few different orders of magnitude such that even if I know the whole equations and if I have to solve them, I'll be needing a very large long time to solve that very simple case. And there are many of those holes there. And there are many such airfoils in an engine and multiple engines in a power plant. So we are in a pretty bad spot. So what we do? So what we do is basically we do model testing and validation. We simplify that test the equations, we test in the lab, and then we validate. So with that in mind, what is new here for us? So we can have artificial intelligence for faster simulations. CMC or IT manufacturing can give us different designs. And then we have to look for how the hydrogen or supercritical CO2 may be affecting our cooling strategies. So this is one area that I can think of. The other area that I can think of is what we call digital twin, but everybody has got their own definition. So I'll be starting with my own, where basically we start with a digital thread, description of the entire machine, which is the physical twin, and that must age as the digital machine. Uh, will will edge um, digital the physical system will edge and then we have to have some set of dynamic system model a set of sensors to get data and then the data has to be analyzed through machine learning or anomaly detection and then as we are comparing the data with the physics they will not match and then we may have to go to localized in-depth simulation as you know from the previous slide that we cannot do that or we cannot afford to do that for every single case. So that is what we have been working on. That is a flowchart that I just said. But what we can do with this technology? Well, we can go for digital maintenance, repair overhaul for the airplanes. We can do digital power plant maintenance for the power plants. We can have fault detection for space systems like in a Mars habitat. And actually in these last two topics, just in last two months, 
we got four projects funded, one from NASA and three from DOE. And these are some of the older results that I'm not bored you with because we are short of time. So with that in mind, I would actually go to um, the last slide and give the acknowledgement. Obviously, the first group of students that I need to group that I need to acknowledge are the students. And out of those 26 PhD students and 56 masters and honors in major, I already mentioned that they have gone to different OEMs. Then uh, the current set of students, obviously my colleagues in Keter, mostly from mechanical aerospace, but also Dr. Sue from statistics. Um, and also our research faculty and courtesy faculty members. Since I cannot show everybody's picture, I just picked up one specific picture from uh, a 2010 group that attended EIA Joint Propulsion Conference. And we see that they actually did are doing pretty well. Many of them are in Siemens. One went to Edison Fellow to GE, then startup in Boston right now. Two of them became professors. One is in Purdue and one is in Emory Riddle. Then others FTT, uh, NG, and Siemens to Alstom and things like that. So at the end, this is our product. And that is what um, I like to end my talk with.